He's an American author, lecturer, guide, and proponent of the Sphinx water erosion hypothesis in geology. Influenced by R.A. Schwaller de Lubitsch in 1993, his work with Robert M. Schoch, a geologist and associate professor of national, natural science at the College of General Studies at Boston University, was presented by Charles Heston in an NBC special called The Mystery of the Sphinx that won West an News and Documentary Emmy Award for Best Research and a nomination for the Best Documentary. All right, John, welcome. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, there's another thing I wanted to mention. There's uh, books available on the website. Serpents in the Sky, The High Wisdom of Ancient Egypt, The Traveler's Key to Ancient Egypt, and The Mystery of the Sphinx. You also did a book on astrology. Is that in reprint yet? No, it isn't, but it, it's fairly soon it will be. We've scanned it in, and I think I have to do some editing and maybe a new forward for it. Uh -huh. But it will be back self-published in print in the not-too-distant future, but I can't say when. All right. Awesome. So, um, John, can you tell us a little bit about your book, Serpents in the Sky? Yes, uh, Serpent, Serpent in the Sky is an introduction to the work of um, the amazing French genius with the unpronounceable name that you, in fact, pronounce pretty well, <laughs> um, R.H. R. Valère de Lubix, uh -huh. uh, who was uh, an extraordinary uh, character, of, uh, mystic, uh, orientalist, practicing alchemist, a profound scholar, Pythagorean, all of those things, uh -huh. born in 1890 or 91, and a boy genius. He was doing lectures for the Theosophists at the age of 16, mainly on Pythagorean mathematics. Wow. And in the, I mean, he, he probably knew more about Western, the, the Western uh, hermetic disciplines uh -huh. than anybody else in recent years. But he didn't get into Egypt until the middle 30s when he went to Egypt with his wife and went to Egypt. I made the mistake of that this actually in, in Serpent in the Sky because I thought he just went on a holiday. But he, in fact, I, I, in later, the later works came out that clarified uh, this point. He went in, in order to see if indeed the, the hermetic disciplines um, were as the great as the Renaissance, the Renaissance astrologers, numerologists, magicians, um, etc., etc., Neoplatonists, all of all of those scholars of the Renaissance claimed that their disciplines went back to ancient Egypt, mm -hmm. but there wasn't no evidence that they, or any in the heart, you know, in the modern sense of the word, mm -hmm. uh, no hard evidence that in fact they did. So Schwaller traveled to Egypt with his wife. Uh, in 1937, mainly looking to see if he could verify that Egypt had that the, the basic knowledge. And what he was looking for was specifically, he was, he was a mathematician himself and a, a great geometer. He was looking to see if, if the Egyptians knew and utilized the so-called golden section, the, the harmonic measure, the perfect proportion. It's called the golden ratio, it's often called. Mm -hmm. And with it, it's it's closely associated with the Fibonacci series. To make a very long story short, could I tell the story of Serpent in the Sky in the book, uh, he quickly found out that indeed they did use it, including also its spin-off into the di diatonic scale, the musical scale. And he went, he had, in visiting the Temple of Luxor, he had what, uh, let's say, mystics call a revelation. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, poets call a an inspiration mm -hmm. and scientists call a hypothesis formation in order to make it sound as unmagical and as boring mm -hmm. as possible. <laughs> so what Schwaller's revelation was that this strange temple with its asymmetric skewed axis was in fact an exercise in harmony and proportion. Mm -hmm. And he set about he set about trying to prove that and very quickly did. And as I said, not only did he prove 
that they were using the golden section in Fibonacci series and the diatonic scale and the harmonics in the proportions and measures of this particular temple, but by extension, mm -hmm. all of the temples as well, he, he was able to he was able to show that they were using it, and Temple of Luxor is built in stages, but most of it was built around 1300 BC. Uh -huh. In other words, a good 800 years before the rise of Greek civilization, who are, to this day, uh, credited, Pythagoras is credited with being the discoverer of the golden section and of the laws of harmony and so on. So what Schwaller was, was doing by showing that that all of these all of these um, mathematical concepts were expressed in the Temple of Luxor in a much more sophisticated fashion than the Greeks <laughs> ever envisaged, he was pushing back the the boundaries of exact knowledge of that kind of mathematical harmonic knowledge back roughly a thousand years before the Greeks employed it, and by extension. It would go back to the very beginnings of dynastic Egypt. Uh -huh. So, so in other words, this was this was groundbreaking work, and Schwaller recognized it as such, and ended up staying from 1957 to sorry, from 1937 to 52, um, studying mostly the Temple of Luxor and putting together what both adherents. Uh, um, supporters, admirers, like myself, of Schwaller's work, and his opponents call the symbolist school of Egyptology, mm -hmm. which sees and demonstrates a high science, sacred science, which in modern rationalist terms is almost a contradiction in terms. I mean, to the, to the modern rationalist, atheist scholar, sacred is just a polite word for superstition. Yeah. Um, Schwaller took a, a very opposite point of view, and so do I. All right. And and anyway, he he by the by the time he was finished with the fifteen years that he'd spent there, as I said, mostly at Luxor, he had reformulated the sacred science of the ancients in a manner that was accessible to our over rationalized contemporary intellects. Uh -huh. And in, in magisterial fashion, but when I encountered his work, and this is a long story that I will tell one of these days in an autobiography or something of the sort, so I can't really get into it here, but the, uh, when, I, when I encountered this work, I was myself involved, and still am, in the, in the school that follows the teachings of G.I. Gurdjieff, mm -hmm. and, and what Schwaller was, was doing was in... in with impeccable detailed scholarship, effectively proving all of the stuff that Gurdjieff was talking about on a take it or leave it basis. Uh -huh. Gurdjieff uh -huh. couldn't have cared less about uh, about the scholarship. But Schwaller, inadvertently, they never knew each other, even though they were both living in Paris at the same time. They never knew each other, but it, it was a it was a, a detailed scholarly demonstration of what the ancient sacred science was and how it worked. Mm -hmm. Problem with it was that it was only in French at that time. I, I really actually had to learn French in order to read the book. And and I spent, I couldn't get a copy of the book. It was, even though it was published in 57, I could not find a copy of it. Mm -hmm. I was living in London at the time, so I went every day for almost a year to the library, learning French and plowing through Schwaller, which unfortunately, in French, and now it's a, it's a wonderful English translation, but Schwaller's pretty impenetrable. You need a certain kind of, what Schwaller calls thinking with the heart, great uh -huh. line. Um, if all you can do is think with your head, you can't penetrate Schwaller or anything else all that's right. sacred, as it were. But so um, I, I had a big chapter in... Um, in my, it was my first scholarly book, actually. I started out as a novelist, playwright, satirist, and I still, I mean, that's almost my favorite hat to wear rather than my um, Egyptological piss helmet. And um, I, I, when I read that book, so in, in the astrology book, which was my first nonfiction book, I included at the beginning a long chapter 
on Schwaller's symbolist interpretation, even though it really didn't belong there. Uh -huh. But I couldn't resist. And then publishers came to me. I'd already had quite a lot of things published and produced, theater and so on. Um, nothing that made any money. <laughs> still the same. Still the same now. And I've just turned 82, <laughs> and I'm still broke. Anyway, <laughs> anyhow, the uh, publishers came to me and asked me if I would do a book on Schwaller. And I said, you bet. And so six years later, out came The Serpent in the Sky, yeah, yeah. Uh, which introduced, and because I'm a writer by trade, this is a, a problem with very often, it's, it's not uncommon that great creative individual minds like Schwaller's um, have trouble communicating to a general audience what they've what they've done because they're at they're working at such a level that they they really don't forget what lesser people are capable of, of understanding mm -hmm. and me as a i was sort of somewhere in the middle i i could i could really understand most of Schwaller pretty well but because i am a writer i was able to by trade i'm a writer i'm a scholar by default so i was i was able to put it into language that was still not bedtime reading by any means it's you know it's not the da vinci code um but at, at least it makes it makes schwaller's extraordinary work accessible and of course it wasn't nothing of schwaller was uh, was in in english at that time i'm talking about the early 70s now mm -hmm. uh, now virtually everything he's written has been translated and mostly it's been translated very well but that still doesn't make it terribly penetrable. So yeah, yeah, The Serpent yeah. in the Sky is still a, even 40 years later, when was it published? 79, something like that, is still a, a really valuable introduction to Schwaller. And if you, if the Schwaller bug bites you, then you go and you read The, the Great Man himself. And I've given, I've given everyone a good head start. And I often, I often tell people, I, I often start lectures because, you know, everybody's, fidgeting around and getting in their seats. So I start a lecture off by saying that Egypt is like sex. As soon as I say that, I have everyone's attention. <laughs> yeah. And they want to know, why is Egypt like sex? Well, it's because you can read all about it. That's interesting. I mean, Serpent in the Sky and lots of other good books on Egypt, Schwaller himself. You can read a lot and get a lot out of it. You can look at pictures. That's graphic and also very interesting. But the, the truth of the matter is that, as with sex, until you've experienced it, you really don't understand it. Mm. So, so with my trips, actually, what what these trips are? I mean, these are not these are not head trips. They're they're experiential. And at the end of a couple of weeks in Egypt, you understand anybody, unless you're emotionally defective and spiritually dyslexic, anybody with emotional faculties still functioning understands the difference between what we call progress and what I call shiny barbarism and what actually was in Egypt a great, great, great civilization hmm. and important, more important than any of the other ancient civilizations, not necessarily because it was more advanced than, say, China or India or Mesoamerica, any of the other great, great civilizations that we've had on Earth, um, but because there is so much left of it that you can still experience. Mm -hmm. You can go to India, you can go to China. There's nothing that goes back to two and 3,000 BC and, and even much further according to our, our own work on the Sphinx. So, so Egypt has that, Egypt has that, is singular, is unique in that sense that you can go there. And of course, in certain of the other civilizations, there's no Schwaller to explain everything to you. And with me as, as um, in Schwaller's case, uh, you know, with me as, as his faithful disciple, you might say. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned the Sphinx. Yes. And uh, I believe Robert Schoch also comes into the picture. Is that correct? Yes, that comes to Dixon. And you pronounce his name correctly as it would have been in Dutch, but. <laughs> yeah. He just he just calls himself shock. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, but actually you're correct. That's how it should be pronounced. Um, anyway, yeah, the Schwaller writing the serpent was you know was a, a major undertaking of its own. But in doing my research for the, for Serpent in the Sky, yeah. there was a long chapter in one of Schwaller's ancillary books, or secondary books, you might say, 
written shortly before he died called Sacred Science in, in, in English. It's now translated as Sacred Science, the King of the Pharaonic Theocracy. And in, in this book, Schroeller had a long chapter in which he discusses the textual evidence that Egypt went back much, much further than it's given credit for by today's academics, mm. who I call quackademics for the most mm. part. Um, yeah. And these, these detailed, these t had accounts of long, long periods, thousands and thousands of years, during which Egypt was ruled first by the Necheru, which means basically the gods themselves. But the gods are not figments of superstition, as the quackademics would have us believe. They are the embodiments of cosmic principles. Egypt's science, Egypt is a sacred science, not figments of primitive imagination, mm -hmm. elaborately described. Um, and then, uh, long, more thousands of years when Egypt was ruled by the Shem Suhar, which means the companions or the followers of Horus. And when you computed all of the dates, because they gave the regnal years of these rulers, um, you got something like 30-something thousand years ago. Oh. Of course, to the quackademics, this was anathema, since they think that prior to the rise of Egypt and the other civilizations of China and India, roughly of Mesopotamia, around 3500 BC, there was no civilization at all. And prior to 10,000 BC, everything is hunter-gatherers, and that's the end of it. You know, it's, there's, no, there's no civilization in our sense. There are no atom bombs. There's no striped toothpaste. There's no <laughs> it's all barbarism back then. Um, anyway, so Schroeller has this long chapter, and then he's talking about Palermo Stone and the Turin Papyrus, and then all of a sudden, out of the blue, at the end of the chapter, he says, and of course, the Great Sphinx of Giza shows unmistakable signs of aquatic erosion, in other words, water weathering. Uh -huh. And when I read that, that was my little revelation or hypothesis formation, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. because Fowler evidently didn't realize himself what, how revelatory that observation was, because the rest of his argument, the rest of his argument was, was, um, was textual, and I mean, it's not science. You can argue from now Doomsday over, let's say, a passage of the Bible or a, over a passage from Shakespeare. You can't turn it into science. There are better and worse explanations, yeah. but none of it counts as science, whereas the weathering to the Sphinx either is water weathering or is not water weathering yeah. um, or, or different kinds of weathering. And I realized that that was a bombshell because I didn't, I'm not a geologist, but I knew a little bit about um, paleoclimatology, you know, ancient climate in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And the Sahara, as far as I knew, and this turns out to be correct, is, um, is, is, is a relatively new desert. Prior to 10,000 BC, it was mostly fertile savanna with periods of, of lots and lots of rainfall. Mm -hmm. And since 10,000 BC, it's been mostly desert with a few relatively short periods where there was more rainfall. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the Great Sphinx of Jesus is the most spectacular sculpture on earth. I, mean, I don't think anybody would argue about that. And if it is weathered by water, it would mean that it must have been there already or was carved during periods of intense rain, uh, rainfall when there was, anyway, lots of Lots of water in Egypt. I made one big mistake in Serpent in the Sky because I, you know, I had to do my own geological homework. So I never, I, 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 I assumed that the water weathering to the Sphinx, and this I had from a geologist. He said, yes, of course, I showed him a picture. That's all in the, in the Mystery of the Sphinx video with Charlton Heston, um, that it, it was water weathered. Um, I assumed it was floodwaters of some sort. Ah. But it turns out not to have been that. It turns out to have been lots and lots of rain. Uh -huh. the, the pattern of erosion of weathering to the Sphinx is such that it can only have been formed by lots and lots of rain. Yeah. Anyway, what this means, and see, this is not just a, 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 a quibble among among academics, because I realized when I when I read that single line from Schroller that in and of itself, that would mean that everything anyone had ever learned in any university or high school or, or postgraduate course in, in, the, in the world about ancient history was completely wrong uh -huh. because 
it had to be, and the arguments about the dating, we still can't date it, but Schock, who was originally being very, very conservative about this, is now a lot less conservative. Oh. I was I, I was saying from the get-go that if the Egyptians are talking, saying that their own civilization dates back to 30-something thousand B.C., they know a lot more about their own history than a bunch of quackademics in the 21st century know. Yep. And so yep. I was I was going with that extreme date. And But there's plenty of, let's say, wiggle room in between. The implications, what's important about the dating is not so much the dating itself, but rather the... We're talking about the most spectacular sculpture on the face of the earth at a a time when there's supposed to be only, you know, primitive hunter gatherers. Not only the Sphinx, not only the Sphinx itself as a sculpture, but the the temples in front of it and, and adjacent to it do not look spectacular compared to other Egyptian temples of the later period, Mm -hmm. but they're built of, of blocks of stone weighing upwards of 100 tons, sometimes more than 100 tons, Ooh. sometimes a couple of hundred tons, um, slotted together like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle, so finely that you can't get a credit card in between the joints. Okay, that doesn't and, sound like hunter-gatherers to me. This is very clever hunter-gatherers, exactly. <laughs> and when we did the Mystery of the Sphinx, we went to a project where they were working with the biggest cranes in the world, land-based cranes in mm-hmm. the world, building a cogeneration plant in Long Island. And we have an interview with Jesse Warren, who's the project manager of that, who was absolutely mind is mind boggled by the by the photographs we had. And he acknowledged that with the biggest crane that we now have, they could lift those blocks, but he didn't he couldn't figure out how they would rig them in order to place them the way that they are in fact placed. So in fact what this means is not only were these were there great sculptors capable of producing the most spectacular sculpture on earth at a time when there's not supposed to be any civilization at all, but this non-civilization of hunter-gatherers had at their disposal a technology that we absolutely do not understand today, capable of producing architecture that we can't produce. Mm-hmm. So this is why when I said before that this is this is revelatory. In other words, this means that everything you've ever been taught about about ancient civilizations and the rise of civilizations has to be thrown completely out the window. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. So this is a big deal. Yeah. And yeah. and of course we've been battling. We've been fighting this battle with the quackademic community <laughs> since <laughs> since since the nineties. Well, since the video came out, I've been doing battling them since nineteen seventy nine when the book came out. But so anyway, you can see. I mean what this does to our current view of progress as beginning with, you know, stupid old cavemen back in whatever it was, the the, the Paleolithic um, and early Neolithic mm-hmm. hunter-gatherers and leading to our glorious civilization where we're poisoning the earth and skies and seas in front of our noses and the whole thing is, is now actually, as we say, I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to read the news on any given day and see anything but 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 a descent into into absolute chaos yeah. so so the the model of a of a true great civilization that had its act together and now we get into the philosophy and the esoteric esotericism of it um, I'll come I'll come to that in a second actually sure. um, but we have we actually can dispense with the view that for all of the garbage that we've, that we've been infused our own personal lives with, the collective lives with, uh, it doesn't, it wasn't always that way. And uh-huh. in fact, if we, my own conviction is that unless we, unless we reinvent the ancient civilizations in a, in a, in a formulation that's consistent with our own 21st century minds, um, there's no hope for civilization at all. If we continue along the path that we're going, this whole thing is going to implode and explode, and maybe pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. As Schroller describes it, to avoid strictly particular religious 
terminology which throws people for a loop. If it's how you happen to be a Christian and somebody's talking Buddhist or vice versa, all of a sudden there's a big argument going. <laughs> so what, what, the way Schwaller described it was that Egypt was a was a one-issue civilization. I mean, one one central idea fueled the 3,500 years of known Egyptian history and in all likelihood went back a lot earlier than that because it's hard to imagine a Sphinx and the attendant adjacent temples as being simply the whim of, of, of genius artists. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was itself based upon a profound knowledge of not only of, of cosmic principles, but how to, let's say, make use of those cosmic principles in, in, in personal and in collective lives. Mm -hmm. the, the, I mean, this, this Egypt is a one-issue civilization. This is not to say that people didn't fall in love or certain have wars, you know, the usual stuff that we put up with in our daily lives or that we are subject to in our daily lives. But it's, it's a one-issue civilization, and that issue is the quest for immortality, uh -huh. for eternal life. It doesn't mean that the body lives forever. It means that we, through our own inner work, individually and collectively, arrive at a state of consciousness that does not die when our body dies. Uh -huh. this is, of course, the basis of all the religions, however corrupt they may be in their ins institutionalized forms, yes. which they are, all of them, some worse than others. Yeah. But Egypt you know, managed, even though it was on a downhill track uh, from early on, it was at its it's a big mystery, actually. It was at its height, very close to its beginning. And by the time the Romans you know, took over, um, it was corrupted and, and weakened and, and so on. Mm -hmm. Even mm -hmm. so, it was still recognizable. A priest of the old kingdom, say 3000 BC, would have been able, would, would have been understood um, or had the same knowledge, let's say, had the same doctrine that a priest in the time of Julius Caesar and Jesus um, would have had. Yeah. So, in other words, it lasted 3,000 years. Ours is 250 years old, and it's disappearing by the day. At least everything that was any good about it is disappearing. And uh, there is also pyramids found in South America and China. And uh, how do we view this? Is this is this like there was a one-world culture thousands of years ago, or or what do we read from this? A um, couple of things actually. One, it's a big mystery why they would build pyramids in the first place. We don't know why they built them in Egypt, ah. and, and for the most part, we don't know why they built them in China or different in Mesoamerica. So there's there's something, as I said, we really don't know why. Okay, and, and they occupy a kind of a, a, a latitudinal belt. They're not <clears throat> somewhere around 30 degrees of, of the latitude and almost all of them, and they're all over the place, they keep finding new ones, are in that belt. Somebody oh. knew something and erected these strange these strange um, structures more or less in a line with each other and not far to the south and not far to the north. We don't know why, huh. but yes, not necessarily just because of the pyramids, but there are lots and lots of other um, of other reasons to postulate um, a, a global civilization that went down under cataclysmic conditions, two separate cataclysmic conditions. My colleague Robert Chalk is, is very much into this aspect of, of it, um, mm -hmm. and he's got, the science, he's got the science credentials behind him. To, to actually pursue it, and I don't. And my interests are more the philosophical and spiritual sides of it anyway. Any, but to, to um, say, how shall I say it? The, there's an event that happens around 11,000 BC, probably a comet or, or some sort of an asteroid or something that, that penetrates the atmosphere and, and actually the ice age is in full swing at that time, <coughs> creates an even colder ice age for about 1,000, 1,200 years. Uh -huh. And then all of a sudden something happens, and this is getting a lot of scientific credibility behind it. Something happens, Shock is pretty well convinced, and there's a, a, a physicist named um, Anthony Perrot who works at the Los Alamos, uh, you know, the government yeah. space laboratory, who who are who are 
getting convinced, and they're not the only ones who've thought of this, but Perot's work and Shock's is, you might say, the most, they have the most scientific credibility to, to be putting forth this theory of CMEs, coronary, coronary, um, coronary, um, coronal, <laughs> coronal mass ejections. In other words, these gigantic sun sunspot storms, electrical storms. Um, do you know about those? Yes. The, the, the last one, which is minor by, let's say, by, paleo, by, by paleoclimatological standards, the last one was called the Carrington event. Uh -huh. I guess he was a guy in England, who, a guy named Carrington, who, who, who determined what it was that was creating these extraordinary things that were going on in the sky. And this was in 1859. Uh -huh. It was, a, as I said, by cosmic standards, this was minor, but it was enough to completely fry everything that was electric in, 19, in 1859, oh. which is not mostly it was the telegraph lines. Yeah, the, yeah. Nature. But these things happen. These are, you know, the, 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 the solar storms that pop up every now and again. And, and even today, these little bitty minor blips will destroy, you know, will, will, will black out the city. Montreal had it happen a few years ago. Yeah. But, but the shock's conviction and Peratz as well <clears throat> is that this happens periodically not necessarily cyclically. I mean, you can't, at least, no, we don't know enough about it to say it's every 3,000 years or it's every 12,000 mm -hmm. years or, you know, there's no real schedule for it. But there's there's plenty of evidence that very severe ones have happened in the past. Okay. And so around 9600 BC, 9700, there is one of these tremendous events. Mm -hmm. And Strangely enough, that's the date that Plato gives for the destruction of Atlantis. Okay. We don't think there is an Atlantis as a specific site in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean or anywhere else, but we think that it's a name applied by the ancients to a global civilization mm -hmm. that went down when this tremendous car, um, um, coronal mass at CME yep. took place. You see, most of the ancient myths all over the world um, including the Bible, talk about the, the Tower of Babel um, is it, well, talks that you know prior to every whatever it was some catastrophic event, the that that the I forget the exact language, but the, the, the all humanities was of one of, had a common language. Yeah, so just, that's what the Indian language. myths also say from India. Right. Yeah, yeah, all, they all say that. And, that it, it, and, and I think through Laird's work, we can now say that the common language was not necessarily Turkish or, you know, or, or Peruvian or anything like that. It was, cosmolo it was cosmology. Ah. Everybody seems to have had, African tribes have it, um, huh. Eskimos have it, all sorts of things. It relates to a certain extent, another kind of important book in all of this, which doesn't get into what Laird gets into, but is, you probably know that one, Hamlet's Mill by uh, the two historians, MIT historians of science, um, Giorgio de Santillana and, uh, and Hertha von Deckhand, where they're showing that there's a common astronomical knowledge uh -huh. um, pervading the, 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 the legends and the myths of the entire world. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. Don't get, I mean, they're historians of science, so they don't broach the possibility of astrology, but there's really no point in having a highly developed astronomy um, without an astrology, because you don't need a highly developed astronomy to tell you when you got to plant the corn or when is the time to fish for salmon. Uh -huh. Yeah. But he does that. Um, <laughs> so anyway, that, but that's, that's Laird's work. And so that adds, a, as far as I'm concerned, it adds a big piece to the, to the, the puzzle that's now starting to take really sub substantive shape. Yeah. We, we, we know a lot more now than we did when Schwaller was writing. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Another, so, another thing that um, makes me think that they must have known much more, and I haven't gone there myself to check if this is correct, but there's this Napta Playa. Oh, there yeah. Are, there are all these uh, stones over there. Exactly. 
And this one person in the video explained to me that these seem to be uh, randomly placed at a certain point, but that it had actually to do with star distances. Yeah, that's Tom Brophy. That's Thomas Brophy, who's a physicist and uh, uh, archaeo, archaeo, archaeo astronomer. Yeah. And, so you and, wonder how how did they know how far these stars were away, right? <laughs> that's well. With with Brophy, there are kind of three levels of of his book, uh, to, uh, the Origins Map. I wrote the forward to it, or I wrote the afterward to it. Uh -huh. and so forward. Very interesting. I mean, the first part. There's no mistaking that it's got the belt of Orion and so yes, on. Yes, yes. When he's talking about the the distances of the stars and the and the speed at which they're traveling, all I can say is maybe, but I'm I'm not I'm not a hundred percent convinced of that. All right. In part because it, I'm not sure that how they would make use of that, but that 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 doesn't. All right. Mean, I'm not sure. I mean, the Great Pyramid. The star shafts, even the quackademics now acknowledge that they're star shafts, not ventilation shafts. Yeah, all right. Aren't particular stars, why? I mean, yeah, why, should why indeed? We go to all that trouble to some people have have uh, uh, radio engineers have suggested, and I think makes sense. I mean, I'm not a radio engineer, so <laughs> I know enough just to acknowledge when I don't know. A few years back. In which they're talking about about the pyramids, as was on the pyramids, as the pyramids as uh, immortality machines, and then there was a kind of a implicit wink, wink, nod, nod, <laughs> so, as if these ja jackasses at, at the Smithsonian and at the National Geographic knew more than the ancient Egyptians who were building the pyramids. Yeah, but in fact, I think that's probably correct. Uh huh. Except Except that the Egyptians knew what they were doing, and the contemporary quackademics who are who are winking and winking and nodding and nodding haven't a clue. This, by the way, is a, a point. This is really a point that um, that should be made. Whenever you read anything, in, whenever you get it in school or or uh, <sighs> university or graduate course. And they're talking about ancient civilizations and the mythologies and the legends and so on, mm -hmm. and the symbolism. They're always saying that it, I, I can't think of a single instance where they've said otherwise. The Egyptians believed this, and the Egyptians believed that, or the Peruvian, you know, the yeah. Incas. This. Not once have I ever read them say or heard them say, "Hey, maybe they actually knew what they were doing." And as you stupid jackasses who don't know what they're doing. Yeah, it's it's like they say, well, the ancient Egyptians believed this. In other words, it's not true. <laughs> That's how they bring it, right? And even the word, the language is very important. Myth is used, is often used as, even by people who should know better, is, is used as a synonym for a lie or a fabrication. Yeah, that's incorrect. In fact, what myth actually is, is a means of of describing in dramatic fashion the interplay of cosmic principles. Uh -huh. It is actually a, a, an extraordinarily advanced, complex science on many, many levels. Yeah, and myth is the it, first science, right? Yeah, well, it really is. Yeah. And, and it's a way of expressing it so that everyone can understand it. Whereas with us, at the high levels of quantum physics and string theory and all that sort of stuff, on, only the mathematicians can understand each other. And for the, <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's for useless, the, isn't they, it? Well, at least they understand yeah. it, or sort of. They, they, they're limited as well because they don't understand that consciousness, cosmic consciousness, is at the basis of all of this stuff. Uh -huh. So, anyway. Um, all right. Uh, we are... Uh, one hour gone. Yeah, I think we're. I think we're. We had. <laughs> it's bad enough for today, don't you? Yeah, I had more uh, notes that I wanted to discuss yeah. with you, but uh, don't as worry as about it. You, as I warned you, I'm very long-winded. It's a all right. Thanks a lot. You're George. very welcome. I Thank think it was much. awesome. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, see what happens. Uh, by, by, let me know what feedback you get. I will. Sure. I will send you okay. an email with uh, some of the comments. Uh, 
That's okay. what we're getting. Okay? Thank you. I, I appreciate having that. Thanks Thank a you. lot, John. Take care, buddy. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.